The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Today what we want to do is finish off our discussion of lotka volterra competition models. All right, so starting with this idea of the two species interacting competitively, but then moving on to try to think about the general properties of lotka volterra systems, in particular when you have more species, the kinds of dynamics that you can get. Uh, also, we're going uh, to talk about these non-transitive interactions, which are uh, the rock, paper, scissors type interactions that may uh, facilitate the maintenance of diversity in populations or ecosystems, uh, in particular in the presence of, of some sort of spatial structure. And so we'll talk both about this uh, demonstration of rock, paper, scissors type interactions in the context of male mating strategies in lizards, or this paper uh, that was by Kurt Lively. And then, uh, and then we'll uh, talk about uh, another paper in the microbial realm where they showed that there are rock, paper, scissors type interactions in the context of uh, colicin production, right, so ant uh, kind of toxin production in the context of bacteria. Then uh, at the end, we'll, we'll talk about these population waves, which is uh, there was a rather mathematical reading in, uh, that I would had originally proposed, but then we kind of switched things up a bit so that uh, you could instead read that rock, paper, scissors paper, that I, uh, rock, paper, scissors paper. OK, that is confusing. Uh, that I think is maybe more fun, but I'll, I'll tell you kind of this, uh, this basic idea of the population waves, what happens if you have a, co a combination of uh, kind of some growth process together with some effective diffusion, you can get these population waves uh, that correspond to uh, this process of range expansion where a population expands into new territory. Okay. All right, so I, uh, tr I wanted to, I just started by uh, putting up what we had from, from last class. So this is the two species Lotka Volterra competition model. Right, so what we found was that uh, for this to be competition, right, for the species to be kind of bad for each other, that, that corresponds to, uh, to the betas being positive. Right. Now, uh, what, what, we, what we found is that there, there, are four, uh, there are four cases in terms of the outcome of this two species interaction. And we wanted to at least try to get some sense of why that was and what this kind of, um, what the, the trajectories might look like in terms of, you know, if you look at N1 and N2, we can draw these null clines and then get a sense of uh, where the trajectories are going to go. Now, the basic outcome of this two-species Lotka Volterra uh, competition model are really exactly the same as the uh, possible outcomes when we were thinking about frequency-dependent selection, right, where we could get, in this case, that uh, we could get that species 1 dominates or species 2 dominates, right, 1 or 2. Uh, but then we could also get coexistence or bistability, right? And indeed, there's, uh, in general, a mapping from the, the Lotka Volterra kind of approach here and, uh, and the general, um, the, the approach that was kind of in Martin Novak's book of you can, thinking about uh, frequency dependent selection in, in this population. Okay. So the, there's, uh, and, and so then it's not a surprise that there, you get the same four outcomes uh, in, between these two situations. Okay. Uh, and I think that this is also highlighting uh, some uh, very interesting kind of deep connections between uh, evolution, which is changes in, say, allele frequency in a population of a single species over time, and, uh, and then some of these ecological kind of processes, right, of where you're really thinking about these as different species. Right? Uh, now, of course, in, these, uh, in, in the case of the evolutionary dynamics that we analyzed in Martin's book, though, those were uh, the evolution of different, uh, different clonal populations and asexual, uh, asexually reproducing populations. Do right. you guys remember what I'm talking about? Oh. OK, so I, I just want to uh, draw a, a couple of these sorts of diagrams. Uh, I'm not going to draw out all four of them, because it does take some time. Uh, but, uh, but hopefully, we can, we can reconstruct where, uh, where we were. The, the case that we, were, we started at, that we were analyzing before, right, so we might, the n1 dot equals 0 we're going to have as a dashed line, and n2 is going to be, although maybe we'll use, try to use thick chalk. Oh, wow, I missed. OK. These are thick lines, and, right? So we'll draw these, uh, these null clines over here, right? So the n1 dot, and indeed one of the comments is that it would be nice to draw where the null clines are on the axes as well. Um, and, and indeed, we can. We can do that. We, tr we aim to please. All right, so the dashed lines correspond 
to n1 dot being equal to 0. So here's n1, n2. Okay. All right, so n1 equal to 0 corresponds to this thing. Okay. And then we have this other guy that's a line here. Now, what we found is that if n2 is equal to 0, this intersects at uh, k1, whereas the intersection over here is at k1 divided by beta 1, 2. Okay. Now, we have, uh, we have our other uh, null lines that correspond to n2 dot equal to 0. All right. Now, one of those lines is indeed going to be along here. Uh, and the, the other line uh, can fall. There are four different possibilities for how we might draw it in relation to this n1 dot equal to 0 kind of null line. Right? And depending on the orientation of that, you will we'll end up getting uh, these four different possible outcomes of 1 dominating irrespective of the initial conditions, 2 dominating irrespective of initial conditions, or coexistence, or bistability. So bistability is the uh, only out, you know, so if you start with a finite number, of each of these two species, then bistability is the only case where the, uh, the outcome depends on uh, the starting condition. Right? So of course, if you, if you start out without one of the two species, then you won't uh, get creation of those species. right? Because the only way to get creation of species 1 is by, to have some species 1 individual in this model. Right? <coughs> right, so we're going to get another line here corresponding to n2 uh, dot equal to 0. And uh, I think that the one that we were trying to analyze was was with the solid line underneath. Is that consistent with people's notes? OK. All right. So we can, uh, we can draw some other line here. It doesn't have to have the same slope. Right? Now, it's good to be clear about where these things are going to fall. So k2 is this point. And now k2 divided by beta21 is over here. Now, recall that the betas are telling us, beta12 is telling us about how much species 2 is reducing the growth of species 1, whereas beta 2, 1 is, is the, how much species 1 is reducing growth of species 2. All right. Now, everything comes down to the relative ordering of these two quantities and these two quantities. And since there are two possibilities on each, that gives us the four possible outcomes. Okay. And broadly, the, the idea here is just that if, there are, if the species are weakly interfering with each other, then what should happen? Yes, yeah, so and you should go coexistence, right? Coexistence is when you know the beta, the betas are betas are small. Of course, you have to. This is a concrete model, so you have to define what you mean by small. And indeed, small here ends up being relative to the ratios of these carrying capacities. Okay, if the carrying capacities are just uh, equal to say one, then uh, that's saying that the betas, or are, in particular, sorry, if the carrying capacities are the same, then uh, then the simple way to think about this is just whether the betas are larger or smaller than one, right? Whether the uh, whether each species interferes with the other species more than a member of that other species. Okay? So that's kind of what. So if the carrying capacity is the same, that's what that's what demarcates the different different zones. Okay. All right, so what we want to do is uh, take this sort of diagram and try to figure out where will the trajectories be on this on this diagram, right? Now, it's always good to locate the fixed points. All right. The fixed points of the system are, you know, in somebody, somebody words, uh, how would we define fixed points in this system? What's that? Both lines intersect, right? So when, both the, when the dashed line intersects the solid lines, right? So uh, we have one such fixed point here. All right. We have another fixed point here and another fixed point. Have we yet figured out the stability of those fixed points? No. Okay. Uh, but can somebody offer the stability? What's the stability of this fixed point? Assuming that it's unstable, right? Because we've already and previously assumed that these r's uh, are greater than 0, right? We're assuming that the species would be able to survive on their own, right? And that's actually true for both species. Right? So this. Uh, 
this thing is, un is unstable kind of in both directions, right? And, and wh what are the eigenvectors associated with this fixed point? All right, um, on the count of three, draw, you know, use your arms like the hands of a clock to indicate the directions of the, the eigenvectors. All right, ready? Three, two, one. All right, all right. Is there, OK, so but, yeah, there's no diagonals, right? Right? OK. Um, of course, you could also, you know, I was waiting for somebody to be kind of obnoxious and point in the other <laughs> direction. But um, yeah, a surp a surprisingly um, non-obnoxious class we have. Right? And OK, so this is just saying that if you start out with just a little bit of one species, you'll just stay with that species. Right? Makes sense. OK, now, what do these lines tell us about the directions of the trajectories? Or the orientations of the trajectories? Why did I draw them? Yes? All right, one of the derivatives, all right, and in particular, let's so, look at this line here. Do the, are the trajectories, all right, again, we're going to do the, um, we're going to do again our, hand, our arms to indicate the orientation of the trajectories, okay? In particular, there's a trajectory right here. What direction will that trajectory be pointing? All right, there's only going to be one arm, okay? Ready, three, two, one. All right, we're, we got a lot of people not voting. All right, that means that we need to turn to our neighbors and discuss. All right, if, if you didn't vote, it means you're, I think, n not following what we're talking about. All right, yeah, turn to somebody and, and Right, and, and another question, you know, if your neighbor agrees with you about which direction you should be pointing your arm, then try to figure out whether we, all, whether we know whether, which orientation the, uh, the arrow should actually be in, okay? Oh, yeah, yeah, well, yeah. It should, it, yeah, it should be different on either side. Yeah. Yeah. And, the point is, and the question is then whether that is like a stable line or like an unstable line? Yeah. We'll, we'll figure this out. Yeah. Um. Yeah. 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 All right, let's go ahead and reconvene because it seems like some people are being quiet. But I'm not sure if that's because they've figured, they think they know what's going on or they're just very much unhappy with the situation. All right, but let, let me see, let me see uh, a fresh voting. All right, ready? Three, two, one. Okay. Definitely, it's going to be up or down, right? Because the definition of this dashed line is that n1 dot is equal to zero. Right? We don't know what n2 dot is. Right? We'll figure that out in a moment. But what we know is that the trajectories which should be something lines here, all right? Either up or down, and we're going to find that they're down. But here, all right? Now, on this solid line, quickly, the orientation of the trajectories. Ready? Three, two, one. All right. Perfect. OK. So we know that n2 dot is, is 0 here. Okay. Now, an actual direction of the trajectory at this point Right here. Ready? Three, two, one. OK, good. Right, because in the absence of n2, we know that species n1 should just come to carrying capacity k1. Right? Same thing over here, we should get arrows coming down. Right? So indeed, what you can see is that the arrows coming, are coming down here, and that means they actually do have to come down immediately to the right of them. Okay? Whereas over here, the trajectory is pointing right here. So um, we can kind of figure out that, all right, so they're coming here. And from far away, they're coming here. And you can see that they have to come across here. And then they're going to come into this point. All right, so this is going to be our stable fixed point. I'll color it in to indicate that. From here, they're going to curve around, though. So if you start out right here, you kind of do this business. Okay. 
Whereas from here, we come in, right? Are these lines allowed to cross each other? No. Okay. Right. Now, and indeed, you can actually see here what is the direction of the other eigenvector at this at this point using a hand arm. Okay, ready? Three, two, one. All right, it's kind of something in there, right? Because all these trajectories are coming here, and then they, they approach this fixed point from this point. Because there's here, the other, the other eigenvector is still horizontal, right? Because we know if we don't have n2, then we just have n1, right? But this other eigenvector is not purely straight up. Right? The other one is along here, because the trajectories are coming in along that. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, so in this case, and we should just be clear, we are in the situation where k1 over beta 1, 2 is greater than k2. Right. And this is another, another way of writing that is that beta 1, 2 is less than k1 over k2. Right. So that means species 2 does not strongly harm species 1. Okay. Yet, we know that k1 is greater than k2 divided by beta 2, 1. All right, so that means that beta 2, 1 is greater than k2 over k1. Okay. This is telling us that species 1 is strongly harming species 2. Okay. Well, all right, that makes sense. In that case, species 1 wins. Right. Does that outcome change if we change the r values, the division rates? Right. A is yes, B is no. I'm going to give you 10 seconds. What I just said, that if I change R's, does that change the outcome? Ready? Three, two, one. All right, so we got a majority of B. So the answer is no. All right, this statement that in this situation, species one do uh, dominates. That's independent of the R's. Okay. The fixed points, and, and actually, and what you see is the conditions here only depend on the, what's in here. All right, so the actual shape of those trajectories will depend upon the R's. All right. So if it's the case that species 2 divide, is just a, grower, a faster grower than species 1, then you might end up with a situation where if you start with a little bit of each, you might come clo way up here. Well, no, I guess. You might come close to this fixed point. So you might think that it really looks like species 2 is about to win. But eventually, it'll curve over and come back. Right? And, uh, and indeed, uh, in the Strogatz book, the, one of the chapters that I recommended, they ha he has an example of you know, sheeps and rabbits. The idea is that they are uh, competing species, maybe eating similar foods. I don't know if that's true. But the rabbits can divide more rapidly. Right? So that here, the idea would be, well, if, if the sheep can really displace the rabbits, because it's just bigger and push them aside, then what can happen is that the rabbits first divide rapidly. It looks like they're going to take over. But over time, eventually, the sheep population uh, kind of grow up, and they start displacing the rabbits. And then you end up excluding the rabbits. Okay. This is this phenomenon of competitive exclusion. All right, it's and depending upon the context, ex, ex, OK, that's an E. Ex, depending on the context, this is either more or less maybe formally phrased. But the idea is that, uh, that if there are two species that are, per, that are too similar, and in particular if they're kind of somehow perfect competitors, they're really just trying to eat the same thing, then you should only uh, end up with one of the two species surviving. Okay? Um, and and that's, that's the kind of idea here. Although I think you can argue about the mapping, I think. So this is one of the uh, this is one of the four outcomes, right? It's um, I don't it takes you know t of course it takes 15 minutes to go through each of these examples, so we're not going to go through all of them, but um, but you should be able to, for a given combination of betas and k's, right, be able to figure out using some combination of algebra, you know derivatives, fixed point stability analyses, and drawing of things. Uh, well, you should be able to do all of the above, right? Are there any questions about 
where we are here? What's the? Okay. All right, let's. I guess the none of this folds in the surface. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Uh, for example, in that, like in that case, if R2 is much bigger, then you're going to like get almost very close to like K2, and then maybe just the last individual that will die. Right. Um, so yes. So it's certainly the case that uh, that it, once you have stochastic extinction, and, and the thing is that you would probably be most susceptible to stochastic extinction in the case in the case you're talking about. You'd be most susceptible to stochastic <laughs> extinction when you're around here, actually, because I think that these trajectories are are still always um, moving up in k in n one space, right? Because I, I just want to be. I, I think I know what you're saying, right? Because we're gonna maybe zoom in onto this n1, n2, right? Because we have this unstable fixed point here. And the claim was that if you start out over here, uh, then the trajectory might look something like this, right? And you'd say, oh, well, you're, you might go extinct here. Uh, I guess my, the idea was just like the statement that it doesn't depend on r1 or r2 is like a very dynamical statement. Ah, yes. No, that, like yeah, you know, I, at all is always, yeah, it, it, it's true that I guess things change. Uh, oh, there are a number of things you might want to say. Um, first of all, okay, this is a purely well continuous and deterministic description of the of the setting. Uh, it allows for fractional individuals, right? Um, there's no shocks or perturbations that you have to worry about. Uh, I guess the only thing I wanted to say in, in regards to your question is that uh, it's not. I think the stochastic extinction will not be dominated. Uh, this, you know, we're talking about stochastic extinction of species one. It will not be dominated due to stochastic extinction here, but stochastic extinction at the beginning. Because all, I think, although you know, I haven't drawn this very, very well, but uh, in this case, I think these trajectories always are going up in, in numbers of one, right? And in, in numbers of the one species, which means that you're most likely to experience stochastic extinction at the beginning. Yeah? That, that's all true. Um, although I think we have, to, we, we have to be careful about many of these things. Um, right, so in particular, if you go and you do a stochastic simulation of this, so let's say you plug this thing into a Gillespie simulation, right, can you get stochastic extinction? A, yes, or B, no. Ready? Three, two, one. No. All right. Yeah, so the answer is no, but why? I mean, it depends. Like, if you take R to be a combination of both. Per, yeah, exactly, right? So, so right now, as written, there's no death. Right? Although, although I guess you could say that this is a death. Well, all right. Well, we have, it's just, there's a question of how you partition things in your, you know. So in principle, all these things, this is the difference between the growth and the death rate, right? But the most straightforward way of doing such a simulation is that you put this whole thing in here as a rate for birth, right? All uh, right, you know, somebody's going to say, oh, that's not how I was going to do the simulation, right? <laughs> OK, well, that's probably how you were going to do it. Uh, <laughs> you know, no, but if you did that, then that if there's only birth, then you can't get stochastic extinction, obviously, right? But in, in, in general, it, and this is one of the things we spend a lot of time kind of thinking about in this semester, right, is that there's a difference between uh, there, there are multiple ways of doing kind of a stochastic sim simulation from a deterministic equation, right? And this thing could just, you could be more explicit and say, oh, this thing is really a B2 minus a D2. So a birth rate minus a death rate, for example, right? And from the standpoint of a differential equation, it doesn't make any difference. But if you, if you, calc if you do the Fokker-Planck approximation or you do a simulation or whatnot, then these, these lead to different things, right? And in particular, the rate of, say, stochastic extinction here increases as B and D increase, right? Because that leads to more of these fluctuations. Okay. Uh, yeah, so there are many things that are different once you include, uh, once you include the stochastic dynamics. But I, I, think you, I think it's always good to get a base sense of the dynamics you know, and, and from the standpoint of just deterministic differential equations before you think too, think too much about the uh, stochastic dynamics, because otherwise you get, you get overwhelmed quickly. Right? 
Any other questions about, about that? Um, okay. uh, what, what I want to do uh, is just spend a little bit of time to think about the more generalized case of more species. Okay. And in particular, we could convert this set of equations. We can normalize by each of their carrying capacities. Um, and we can convert uh, we can convert a set of equations to look something like this. So now we just have xi dot is equal to there's some ri xi 1 minus. And what we can actually do is normalize everything so that it's just written like this. Okay. And normally what we assume is that we've done things such that alpha i i is equal to 1 for all, uh, for all i. Right, so this is just saying that uh, this is the normalization such that each species inhibits itself uh, in a way that it's just going to give a simple logistic growth. Right? And it's going to set, and it's going to, well, it's going to be logistic growth with uh, carrying capacity equal to 1. Right? And then once you've done that, then, the, then a species in, inhibits itself. Uh, with alpha i i one, and then everything comes down to what the uh, what these various uh, alpha this alpha matrix is. Okay. Um, and uh, I would say that, as always, it's it's really very very important that you can go back and forth between the kind of non-dimensionalized versions of equations and the the base versions. This was something that I, on on exam number two uh, there was quite there were quite a lot of problems with uh, this problem where you know we asked about you know, what happened, you know, what, uh, you know, how do, you know, what, 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 how does the parameter change when you change the strength of expression or this or that, right? Uh, so this is something that I think is, is very important because it, it, this comes up a lot. Okay. All right. So in this case, the alpha matrix tells you kind of everything, uh, and, and there are uh, there are a number of things that you that well the mathematicians have proven about these sorts of equations, and I just want to point you towards some of the things to think about. So first. Uh, all right, and I'm, I'm considering a case where, uh, again, alpha, alpha ij is greater than 0, um, again, for all i and j, okay. or greater than or equal to 0. Well, all right, so some of them can be 0. Okay. But uh, the interactions, when they exist, are uh, competitive. So first, um, if, you, if you start out in the region uh, where all of the species start between 0 and 1, then you stay, uh, you stay in that region. Okay? All right, so if you start, if this is true initially, then it will be true forever. Okay. That's good. Negative abundances you maybe were not so worried about. But it's not as obvious that you can't get above 1. Because there's nothing saying that, in principle, you couldn't have started there, right? Or I mean, that, in principle, you couldn't have gotten there. And certainly, it's physical to think about start, starting outside of that region. Because we often talk about carrying capacities as something that's like, right? if you think about this is an xi as a function of time. So in these, in, these, in these situations, it's not crazy to think about something above the carrying capacity. Right? But this, this mathematical statement about the lotka volterra framework is that if you start out with everything below its carrying capacity, then everything will always stay there. Okay. Uh, and it's all the dynamics uh, occur. And this, is, this is for i equal to 1 to n, do I want to use a big N or a little n? Does it matter? Um, okay. All right, so this is big N, different species. The dynamics occur on an n minus 1 manifold. All right, if we have any mathematicians, they can explain what this technically means. But uh, basically, what it's saying is that there is going to be some n, 
n minus one dimensional kind of surface or volume or whatnot where uh, all the dynamics are going to uh, end up being on, right? And what that, what that means is that, in particular, a limit cycle requires two, two dimensions, right? Requires, sorry, requires 2D, which means that to get a limit cycle requires, um, so then n has to be greater than or equal to 3 to get a limit cycle. Do you, need, you see what I'm saying? Right. Whereas uh, chaos requires um, requires 3D. Okay. And that means that n has to be greater than or equal to 4. Okay. Um, and indeed, you can get limit cycles with n equal to 3, and you get chaos with n equal to 4. Okay. Uh, there's another theorem that says that any dynamics are possible for n equal to 5 or larger. Um, and I, I don't know, chaos seems as much as I would want to ask for. But um, there's apparently a 4D torus, something that is different. All right, this is something to think about in your spare time. All right. Um, <laughs> yes. Uh, well, you know, I mean, like a, like a lot of things. Okay. Um, yeah. No. And and um, and this is worth spending a moment talking about because right. Um, first of all, okay. So here's a two-dimensional thing, right? Uh, the special thing, as you might remember, about um, continuous dynamics is that these trajectories are not allowed to cross each other, right? Which means that. You just can't draw a chaotic, a chaotic trajectory because you're going to have to cross yourself again. And that's also why a limit cycle requires two. Right? Because we, we originally tried to draw a limit cycle in one dimension, and it didn't work. Do you remember this? Right? And the same thing with, you know, you can imagine, all right, here's a nice limit cycle. Okay? Uh, and that, that could be stable. Um, Oh, and incidentally, I, uh, I think you, you were right about, I, I was getting confused about the Poincaré Ben Dixon theorem, because I think there are these funny things. Wait, no, it wasn't you. All right, oh, OK. Well, you know, all these people that complain about what I say. All right, yeah, so I, right, I think it was that, because if you have this, the trajectories are coming in, uh, then what I said was that if you had an unstable fixed point coming out, then you could draw this region, and then you could be guaranteed that there was a limit cycle in there. But you, could, you cannot just based on what I had said, say that if it's a stable fixed point, then you won't get a limit cycle. Right? I mean, and in some other cases, you can prove that, that it doesn't work. And in particular, like in the Lotka Volterra, in the situation where you had, uh, there was, there, you know, in one of the crossings, you have a, it, it's now going to be a stable fixed point. In that situation, you can prove mathematically that you can never get a limit cycle oscillation because of some divergence condition of some function and so forth. But, um, but it, you know, in the example that I was telling you about in the predator prey, it was also the it was true. You know, it was true in that particular case that when that thing is stable, you don't get oscillations, and when it's unstable, you do. But it doesn't. Both directions do not follow from the Poincaré Ben Dixon. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So this is this is a limit cycle, all right? Now it's just that a cha in a chaotic situation, you have to be able to do something where you kind of come around, and then you know every now and then you kind of go over here, and then you go around and around. And then every now and then you come, or, you know, so, something crazy happens. But um, you can see that this situation doesn't work if it's only 2D, right? Do, do, do you see why I'm saying that? Yeah. No, you don't. No, that, you, don't you don't agree, right? No, oh, it's just if it's 2D, then th these lines cannot cross. So you need to have a third dimension so that they, they can just shoot above each other, go above and below each other. And what's the, like, uh, definition? Limit cycle, but that never cross themselves, right? I mean, so I guess yeah, no. Those are obviously not chaotic, but the why? Right, because okay, those things, right? So then, okay, so yeah, right. So this is not actually a class in, in nonlinear dynamics. So we're not, yeah. So normally you, you characterize this uh, Lyapunov exponent, which tells you about how the phase space is kind of growing or shrinking. In the case that you were just talking about, that's a case where all the trajectory they come together, right? So if you, because in this case where this trajectory comes into the limit cycle, if you draw like a blob of, of phase space. It's going to come together over time, right? Whereas in a, in a chaotic system, if you have like a blob of phase space, it's going to diverge and fold and do kind of the, all the craziness. Yeah. Okay. Um. Yes? Um, for the, 
Yeah, right. Uh, so, I, yes, so this is for the, in this lot of Volterra. All right, because in general, you can get a limit cycle with two equations, and, in ge right, and that's with a 2D. And in general, you can, get a, a you can get chaos with three equations, or three variables. Right? But the logical, in the logical Volterra model, it requires three and four, respectively. That doesn't mean that every four species logical Volterra will have chaos, but it means that it's possible to get one. Right? Yeah. Uh, and I think one thing that's just rather striking is that this really is kind of the simplest possible model you can ever write down describing how species or how species might interact or you know, variables might interact or whatnot. And so it's really kind of incredible to me that you can get all these crazy dynamics. Um, yes? I was going to ask about the n minus 1 thing, the dynamics that are going in n minus 1 dimensional manifold. Yeah. Over here, it just looks to me like it's, it's, we have n equals 2, and, and the dynamics are occurring on, on a plane, on a two-dimensional plane. Oh. Yeah, so I, I think that this is, um, the, you know, the, the, I think that the, the transients or whatever can occur, it, it requires the full n dimensions to describe, right? Because you, you, you can start any, I mean, to describe all of the trajectories clearly requires all dimensions, right? Because, you know, anywhere you start, is, you, have to, you have to specify it by five dimensions, right? But, um, but the dynamics as far as, like, um, well, and, and here there aren't even any dynamics. You know, I think that... You go to a point, right? So I think that's. Um, what do you mean by dynamics? Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree that I that there is a. Um, so in the case of the limit cycles and so forth, this is really like. At steady state, it's doing something, right? So it's here. I think steady state, it only goes to the fixed points, right? So there's no. Yeah, but in two. But if you have a three-dimensional system, then. You, you can have at steady state uh, the trajectories on, a, on like a plane. You know. uh, and then, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is this because there's like some concept of emotion that can be balanced for the system? Uh, I, I don't think that that, so I'm, I'm, not, I'm not aware of that being the case, but I'm hesitant to say that it's not true. Yep. All right. Uh, what I, uh, I want to switch gears a little bit and think about uh, three species interactions, and in particular the th three species in interactions when you ha when they're non-transitive, because this is thought to be potentially a significant uh, stabilizer for uh, for diversity in populations. Okay. Um, So this is non-transitive. Uh, interactions, and, and we, we often just say rock, paper, scissors. Um, all right, has, is, is everybody from a culture that plays rock, paper, scissors? Yes? Yeah. All right, so this is, this is a true human universal. Um, Although I think that what we call it does vary and so forth. You know, how, you know how sometimes the linguists try to find this Ur language that you know, our ancestors spoke 50,000 years ago or whatever? I think that you could probably do something similar with rock, paper, scissors, because it seems to be a pretty common, common theme. Um, right, so the, but the idea here is that you have, wait, which direction does it go? All right, paper beats rock. Okay, right, so paper beats rock, scissors beats paper, but rock beats scissors, yep. Uh, right, so, so you, you can imagine that this, this, can be, this kind of dynamic can be captured in the Lotka Volterra type framework. Right? So you just have to set up these betas or alphas so that this, this is true. Right? And again, dominance, you know, the, this, the way to think about this would be simplest thing is thinking about it as dominance. Right? So that if you have the rock species and the scissor species together, then the rock species will uh, drive the scissor species extinct right? and, and so forth. Right. Now, this is the kind of situation that, in principle, can lead to very complicated dynamics in multi-species ecosystems. 
that, uh, at least in many models, can stabilize the, uh, the coexistence of, of kind of multiple species via some of these complex, crazy dynamics that, um, that we were just talking about. I would say that as a mechanism for the stabilization of diversity, I, I don't know how convincing that, that is in terms of being what explains why it is when there's so much diversity out, outside when you, know, when you look outside the window. But, uh, but at least it's, it's, a, it's in principle true. And, and one, of the, um, one of the topics of these papers that, um, that, well, at least certainly the one that you just read, is that rock, paper, scissors, i.e. non-transitive interactions on their own, uh, may not be sufficient. But in the presence of spatial structure, maybe it does allow for uh, long-term coexistence of these, these species or, or strategies and so forth. And again, it's not always clear in these situations whether you're thinking about ecology, where these are different species, or you're thinking about evolution, where these are different uh, genotypes. And in, indeed, in the Kerr paper that you read, these are all you know, E. coli. You know, so it's all one species. It's just they have different, uh, different mutations. So that was, that's really uh, rock, paper, scissors in the context of evolution. Right? Whereas in the, in the male mating strategies paper by, by Kurt Lively, uh, so that's, that's more of an ecological context, but it still is evolution within the species. Right? Because uh, because it is the, these mating strategies are heritable. Okay. So I'll, I'll explain the. Um, I, I did tell you the base idea of this lizard mating strategy business. Or did I never say anything about that? Oh really? Okay. Uh, for some reason, I thought that I had alluded to it. Okay. Well, let me uh, let me explain it to you. It's. Uh, I think it, it's kind of an incredible paper. Uh, Right, so, uh, so this is a paper by, uh, by Kurt Lively. So it's Cernervo, Cernervo and Lively. Uh, it was Nature in 96. Okay. Yeah, and it's, it's called uh, The Rock, Paper, Scissors Game and the Evolution of Alternative Male Strategy. So what, uh, what, what was known is that there are many examples of um, of alternative uh, mating strategies in males. In particular, it's rather common that there are what you might call uh, territorial males. And, and what, what they often call sneaker males. This is observed in, in fish and in various land animals. And in many of the cases, these sneaker males uh, really do look phenotypically um, like females. Uh, and the idea that, and this has been measured you know, using various kinds of observational experimental approaches, is that there's often what you call negative frequency dependent selection um, between these, these strategies, in the sense that if, um, if there are, that the sneakers can often, uh, when rare, can, can spread a population of the territorial and vice versa. Um, but this was a, at least the first case that I'm aware of where um, kind of these ideas had been demonstrated in as that there were really three strategies, and the three strategies implemented one of these rock, paper, scissors interactions. And um, I want to uh, maybe make a little more space. Uh, if, if you guys are available after class, I encourage you to come up and look at the, um, look at the paper, because they actually have pictures of them, so you can identify the sneaker males. Um, and because and, and, they, they actually look different on, uh, based on the coloring of their kind of throat. Okay? So, these are, um, right, so these are lizards that live in the mountains up um, outside of the Bay Area in California in Merced, Merced County. They're, uh, they're side blotched lizards. I don't know anything about that. Uh, right? And what, what they showed was that there's, uh, there are these, got these guys with orange throats. That are um, kind of aggressive, and they 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 defend a very large territory uh, with a, a large number of, of females, and they they fight off any males that, that come. Then there are um, the dark blue. Oh, sorry, I should have put that over here. So there there are other lizards here that are that are dark blue. Um, throats. And these guys are um, less aggressive with s smaller territories. All right, so you can guess uh, if it were just the orange-throated guys and the dark blue. And these are 
these are genetically encoded strategies in the sense that they do seem to be passed on, and it's, it's determined by the, uh, the genes that, this, that the, the male inherits. And less aggressive and small uh, territory. All right, can you, imagine, can you guess which one wins uh, between these two against each other? What's that? The two aggressive ones. Yeah, but if you just have the two aggressive ones. Yeah. Right, then it's the, this guy is going to beat this one, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, that's just because this aggressive male has a larger territory and you know, passes on its, they pass on more genes than the less aggressive ones. Okay. Um, however, what they found is that there's a third mating strategy here, which are these, um, these sneaker males. And they, um, they, they indeed look like the females. They have these yellow stripes on their throats. They look like the female, and they have no territory, OK? Sneaker males. Uh, so they don't, they don't defend any territory. Instead, they just sneak, on to the, sneak into the, the territory of, these, of the other males and try to, try to mate with the females in that territory, right? And what, what they show is that over the course of like seven years uh, in, this, in the mountains of Merced, they, they see that the frequency of these things goes through an entire oscillation. Okay, so they kind of they see just over one period of, of this oscillation, uh, and and their their argument is that although it's true that the aggressive males can outcompete the less aggressive ones, the sneakers actually outcompete the these these aggressive ones basically because the these aggressive males uh, it's just too large of a territory for them to effectively uh, defend it. Okay, so the sneakers can actually uh, outcompete uh, the aggressive males yet. The less aggressive ones can outcompete the sneakers because they uh, are trying to defend a smaller territory. Right? So they, they, they went and they basically measured the uh, frequency of these strategies and also the number of females in the different ter uh, territories uh, over, over the time of the, from 1990 to 96 or so and, uh, and saw that this thing kind of went around in some circle in this frequency space of, of alternative male strategies. Yeah. Um, Yeah, kind of incredible, uh, an incredible paper. Uh, so the, so the, the, the idea here is this, is this is a situation where it is uh, non-transitive, right? So there's this rock, paper, scissors type dynamic. And it is also spatial, right? Because these lizards are it, they're, they're in some particular place. They have some territory and so forth. And in this other paper by Benjamin Kerr, what he wanted to do is try to understand something about how the what the role of that spatial structure might be in maintaining the diversity, right? So in this case, the argument was that the reason that the, that you if you go out and you look at these lizards, the reason that you see all three of these strategies is because of this rock paper scissors dynamic, right? So the rare if if one of the strategies becomes more rare, it's going to have an advantage relative to the others. It's going to spread, right? And what Benjamin Kerr wanted to explore is whether that statement could be made in a um, whether, whether somehow you can distinguish between uh, whether the spatial component is, is important or not. Of course, it's hard to do that in the case of the lizards, but, uh, but he was able to implement this in the case of um, some chemical warfare behavior in, in bacteria. Right, so in this paper by Kerr, um, and I, it's also a nature paper um, from 2002. Um, Right. So this paper is called uh, Local Dispersal Promotes Biodiversity in a Real-Life Game of Rock, Paper, Scissors. Uh, all right, can somebody, uh, so you guys read it. So what, what were the three strategies? That's right. So C is the Collison Producers. Incidentally, just uh, this Collison production is kind of an uh, incredible uh, phenomenon already. Right, so this is, these are uh, proteins that are produced that, um, that bind to other bacteria and kind of often make pores in the membrane and kill them. But the amazing thing about the Collison production is that uh, in E. coli and other uh, gram-negative bacteria, the only way that these Collisons are released is by cell lysis. So it's not just that the cell is engaging in some costly behavior in order to make this protein that will kill other cells, but the only way that the toxin is released is by the cell actually bursting open. Okay. 
So it's clear then that this has to be uh, supported by some kind of um, group level or kin selection kind of argument, in the sense that it can ne this can never be good for the individual, right? Because the individual has had to, you know, spill its guts in order to harm harm other cells, right? So the only way that this can be supported is by uh, by inhibiting the growth of competitors and allowing um, your kind of kinmates or other cells that also have this plasmid uh, and therefore also the immunity protein, uh, allowing them to, to grow better. Right? So this is a, a very neat example of uh, it's an altruistic kind of warlike behavior. Right? Right, so this is, this is one of the strategies. What was the other one? Or what, the other two, rather? Resistant, right? So there's R, which is resistant. Uh, okay. And between the C and the R, who wins? R. R. That's right. Because the, you know, it, there might be some cost associated with being resistant, but the cost is not as large as actually bursting open, right? So the, all right, what, what's the last one? Sensitive, perfect. So this is just the normal bacteria, right? Uh, and, and and the argument is that there's some, often a cost to be resistant, which means that sensitive bacteria will outcompete resistant. Yet, if it's just the sensitive and the cholesterogenic strains, then this strain can beat this strain. All right. So this is the idea of the rock paper scissors game in this system. They do say that in some situations, the fitnesses are such that it's like this. Uh, uh, and it's good to take these sentences seriously, right? Because if, if they thought that every time that you isolate a resistant bacterium, that it would satisfy this, they would have said, when you do this, this is what you see, right? Uh, their phrasing tells you that actually, depending upon which strain you get here or there, you, you may or may not see this. So don't feel, so you have to be careful just because there's a nice paper that's written about this. doesn't mean that if you go out and you find particular strains that have these properties that it will always yield this particular outcome. Right? All right, so they, uh, they argue that these strains, just because they have a non transitive interaction, does not necessarily mean that they will be able to, um, to coexist right? in a well-mixed environment in particular. Right? Uh, and in their, uh, in their simulations and the experiments where they did experiments in a test tube, which strain died first? Sensitive strain. Does that make sense? Yeah, right? I mean, um, and, and the other thing to remember is that these strains, there's no reason that they should be accurately described by a logical Volterra type formulation, right? Uh, and in particular, it could just be the case that if you have enough producers and they make enough of the colicin, then the sensitive cells are just all dead, right? Uh, and that will, in general, be hard to capture in this sort of framework. Um, right, so the idea is that if you start with a bunch of n's, uh, you know, n for each of these three, uh, then first you see that the sensitive cells die. Right? Once the sensitive cells have died, then you're really just playing an interaction between these two. Right? In that case, you get the collagenogenic strain dying, and you're left with just the resistance strain. So the question then becomes, um, or one thing I want to I caution you about, though, is that just because in this experiment they saw that coexistence of three rock, paper, scissors type strains uh, was not possible in a well-mixed environment does not mean that that will always be the case. I think that um, often, uh, I mean, this is a very well-known paper in the field. And, and the thing is that often people, it's, it's easy to forget what a paper shows and what it doesn't show. Right? So th what this shows is that uh, there is maybe a set of these three strains that have a rock, paper, scissors type interaction. And in that, those particular three strains that are interacting this particular way via colicin, the killing, da -da -da, 
then they don't coexist in this particular well mixed, you know, but maybe and maybe other well mixed environments as well. But it, this does not necessarily show that any rock paper scissors interaction in a well mixed environment will um, not support coexistence, right? So, uh, and in particular, and, and you might remember in Martin Novak's book, there are very reasonable equations that display rock paper scissors type interactions that can lead to coexistence. Okay, so you kind of can spiral in that space to a state of coexistence. So it's possible, but um, but in this situation, it doesn't happen. All right, can somebody remind us how the uh, how they implemented a well uh, or sorry the spatially structured environment? Yeah, right. So they used agar plates. They did this thing where they took this plate and they kind of used a hexagonal grid of some sort, right? Is it actually hexagonal? Yeah. Where they I don't know how they decided on the original order, but they. You know, they said, okay, here's a sensitive, sensitive, resistant, collicinogenic, resistant, I don't know, whatever. So they filled it up. They put maybe 20 different kind of patches there. And then they basically, you know, each, each day they just used a, one of these velvets that we often, we use to, to do replica plating, right? And then they just kind of took off some of the cells and put it on a fresh plate, and then they did this. Um, for a week or so, right? And then, they, um, and then they saw that there was some sense that these, uh, there was a spatial dynamic taking place where, you know, where the spatial structure was kind of reminiscent of this, right? Where the sensitive kind of moved into the resistant, resistant kind of moved into the calcinogenic, calcinogenic kind of moved into the sensitive. But they couldn't actually see all of those, right? Because two of the strains, uh, they said grew to similar density. That was between the sensitive and the resistant, right? So visually, they could only distinguish uh, the collicinogenic stra strain relative to the others, right? But, um, but what they found, though, is that over a similar amount of time, they got coexistence of all three, right? So it's so R, C, S, kind of all they, the numbers as a function of time stuck around on the, in this spatially structured environment. So their argument is that, in some cases, maybe this non-transitive interaction is not sufficient to maintain uh, diversity in a population, whether it's genetic diversity or species diversity. But that it may be that it's very important to have, uh, to have this spatial component. Okay. Uh, if, you're, uh, if you're curious about these things, there's also a nice uh, computational, computational study done by Erwin Fry. Uh, uh, who, uh, who studied kind of these rock, paper, scissors dynamics as a function of the mobility of the individual kind of agents. And uh, in, in that study, uh, he found that there, were, there was sort of a critical level of mobility at which you kind of um, s switch from it being a well-mixed thing with coexistence to, um, sorry, from a, from a spatially structured environment with coexistence to above some mobility, you end up with uh, losing the diversity because it, it kind of goes into this well-mixed kind of regime. So uh, yeah, so if you're curious about these things, um, I, uh, you can look up Erwin's paper. Okay. Are there any questions about what they did here, what you think it means? Yeah. Right, because they can still, uh, they can just scrape off everything in plate. Uh, right, because well, then you can a you can ask, oh, were those guys sensitive to colicin or not? Right, so there is, so you can, yeah, or p plate them on something with colicin or together. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think this is a system that uh, has been very influential, but it's really not. I think it's not yet, or has not been a domesticated kind of model system, in the sense that you know there are not nice fluorescent proteins. These colicin, you know, this is not on a nice cloning plasmid. It's just kind of it was a, a natural plasmid, um, and the this resistance strain. It was just what they the way that they get it is they basically they 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 take some sensitive cells and they add colicin. You know, they say the supernatant from here, and they ask which cells grow, and then that's a resistant cell, and it's genetically resistant. But then you know each one's going to be different. Often, uh, it can, you know, they, you know, they have done sequencing. It's a, say a surface pro, it's a surface receptor that the colicin maybe uses to go in, or other things. But 
I, indeed, we, we actually did some experiments with some of the, these, uh, these strains, and it, 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 it's a little bit messy. You know, I think that there's a sense that, you ha that the field maybe needs to um, just make some nice plasmids with nice colors so that we can really distinguish things. Because I think that this system, despite, I mean, 500 citations or so, uh, almost none of those citations are experimental papers really <laughs> exploring this, this thing. Because you know? I think that it, it still is it's just uh, a little bit messy. Uh, but I think that it's, it's, also, you know, it's also a very pretty uh, system to explore these ideas. Oh, oh, right. So the question is, why, why can't you distinguish these? And um, you know, they say it's because they're similar densities. I, I don't even know if that's even. Um, you know, of course, if you just take, well, if you if you added sensitive cells here and sensitive cells here, and they grew up, it, you know, it's likely you're not going to see a boundary, right? And all, just more generally, if you take similar strains, and these are rather similar strains, this is just has some mutation relative to this, then you won't often see a boundary when, they, when the colonies kind of grow up. Um, so they didn't see the boundary. Oh, right. So they, they saw there were cells there, but they, they didn't know, they, they couldn't necessarily say that it was, the, it was true that the sensitive cells were kind of spreading into the resistance zone region because they couldn't see the boundary. All right, so uh, in the last 20 minutes here, 15, 20, um, I just want to say a few things about um, these population waves. Right. And so for many, many purposes, there's, uh, there are strong arguments to be made that in the context of evolution and ecology, you know, spatial kind of dynamics matter. Right? And the way that we often think about the spatial dynamics is um, via some effective diffusive process. Right? And that's convenient because we know a lot about how to model it. But it's also maybe uh, a reasonable description of the m motion of animals and other, other living things over, over length scales that are large compared to the movements of the animals. Okay? Right, so what we do is we take some equation such as, well, we often have, say, dn dt. Uh, all right, so this is going to be about population waves. Uh, right, so we take our standard thing where we say, oh, here's R n 1 minus n over k. Okay. And then we just want to add some spatial dynamic. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, all right, now the derivative, now it's a density. So we're going to use a little n just to, for fun. All right. And we might still use a k just for simple. Uh, but then we, we have to add some diffusive term. So there still is going to be a local carrying capacity. Now this is in terms of density of the organism. And we're going to assume that there is some diffusive type motion of the organism. Now this is, saying, this is coarse graining over the length scale over which the animals are actually doing things over, their, you know, over shorter time scales. Right? So it could be that uh, different organisms have very different uh, modes of motility. In some cases, they walk or swim. In some cases, they just get picked up by a passing deer. Right? So there are a wide range of, of ways in which organisms move around. But if you look at it over lo kind of longer length time scales, then maybe it doesn't matter. Right? And certainly, if it's, if it's an unbiased kind of motion with um, motility uh, having, uh, being well behaved, right? i.e., if the probability distribution of these steps, as long as it's not long-tailed, Incidentally, right. Oscar Halicek over at Berkeley has been doing a lot of fun work looking at epidemic spread in cases where this kernel, you know, the kind of step size distribution, has long tails. Um, it leads to qualitatively different behaviors. Okay, so uh, if you're curious about such things, check out Oscar's work. But uh, for, for normal kind of step size distributions, then you know, the central limit theorem type considerations just tell you that you, that you can maybe just look at it like this um, over over. Time, time spatial scales that are that are bigger. Yeah. So, but is it that you need correlation between your steps, or because I mean the central limit theorem, like as long as the variance, I guess you're saying that's why I'm saying long tailed. If the variance yeah. is infinite, then 
Exactly. Yeah, so that's what, that's what I was saying. Is that, you know, and, and indeed, people argue in the case of disease spread you know, with modern air travel and so forth that the probability distribution of, of kind of step sizes for infected individuals over the next you know, week is long tailed, right? Because you know, there's a fair chance that you're just going to stay around your local neighborhood, but there's a smaller chance you're going to go to the other side of town. But you might go to you know, a business trip over in DC. At some small rate, though, you also fly to South Africa and go to a conference, right? So all of these things have reasonable <laughs> probabilities. And, um, and so there, there are arguments that this is, this is kind of some power law type distribution. And in, in those cases, right, they don't, you don't necessarily have finite variance. And so, you, so then you can't just shuffle, every, put everything under the rug, right? Um, no. But we first want to understand what happens here. And then we can, well, we're not going to. But then other people can think more deeply about what happens in fancier situations. Right? Um, it is worth saying, though, that this, this approach, I mean, it looks very physics-y in the sense that you know, we, you know, physicists like simple equations that, uh, where we ha add diffusion and so forth. But uh, this, this, this is not what the physicists came up with. This is, um, these are classic ideas in evolution and ecology. Right? So this is, the solution to this was originally uh, done by Fisher. Uh, when he, um, so this was in the 20, 1920s or so, right, so a long time ago, originally to try to understand not the spread of a population, but the spread of a beneficial allele in a spatial population. Right? And once again, this, this highlights this deep connections between evolution and ecology. Right? That you can have a genetic wave in space of, a, of a, uh, a beneficial mutant spreading, or you can have a population wave of an invasive species or whatnot, and, and you end up getting very similar dynamics. Um, right, so the, the basic idea here is that if you look at the, uh, the density as a function of position, right, if you start with, you know, there's one individual, all right, what's going to happen? All right, it's going to start dividing, right? Uh, all right, so we kind of get, you know, and it's going to come up, and eventually it's going to saturate, right, at, at, this, at this carrying capacity k. All right, and then you end up getting these spreading population waves that look like this. Okay. All right, and the reason we're calling it a wave is because the shape of this front is the same over time. All right. So it can really de be described as some, uh, some function as a function of x minus uh, vt. Okay. And right, we are going to maybe typically assume that we're in a situation where we're, we don't have to think about the left and the right because it's just too complicated. So we'll just think, imagine it being that it's at saturation here, and then we're looking at some front that's moving to the right. Okay. Now, by dimensional analysis, we should be able to figure out what the velocity is going to be. Remember how much we like dimensional analysis in this class? Yes. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to, I'll give you some option, you know, characters that you're going to be able to use in your quest. All right. So we can use R, K, D. I'll give you a square root in case you find it useful. And to the, you can raise something to the second power as well. All right, so what you can do is uh, you're going to set up your card so that when I look at it from the left to the right, it will describe the velocity of this wave. Yeah, all right, I'll give you 30 seconds to. So this is dimensional analysis. For, um, for this wave velocity.
All right, do you need more time? Yes, OK, that's fine. All right, let's go ahead and uh, go ahead and vote. All right, uh, construct your answer. Remember, from me, from left to right. Ready, three, two, one. All right, all right. We have we have trouble. You know, a, a key skill is being able to imagine yourself in someone else's shoes. Uh, so, you know, if I'm viewing, okay, but that's okay. All right. So, uh, right, so we have here, this is kind of units of one over time. This is some um, length, square, length squared over time, right? Whereas this is uh, a density, right? If we want something that is a length over time, then we're going to end up having to take r times d and take a square root, right? So it, you should, this should be a d a c, which is a square root of, um, of course, it depends on how you're entering it into your calculator, if you have a scientific calculator or something else maybe, right? But all right. Um, and indeed, it ends up, there's a 2 here. So the, uh, this is the velocity. This, okay. Yes? OK, oh, I see what you're saying, but, it, yeah, but it, it, it ends up not being true, right? So th these derivative signs don't have any, um, any units, right? So this, is, this is still has units of a density divided by a length squared. Right? So for unit purposes, you just look at this thing and this. So th this squared does mean, mean there's a length squared in the denominator, but this squared doesn't do anything. Okay. Um, yeah. okay. so, so d is still a length squared over time. Um, right, so this is the famous uh, Fisher velocity. There, there are some mathematical subtleties to all this that we're not really going to get into. Uh, I don't know if I'm trouble. Okay, velocity. Um, but th this, uh, there are a few features to highlight. If the organism grows faster, the wave is going to spread faster. That makes sense. If it has a larger mobility, it also moves faster. That makes sense. Of course, the velocity is given by both of those things. Right? So this, this wave coming out really is a population level property. Because okay? it's not just growth. It's not just motion. It's a result of the coupled division and diffusion that leads to this population wave spreading. Okay? Importantly, to first order, it doesn't depend on the carrying capacity, okay. at least within the deterministic regime. Okay. Well, it would be okay. So okay. So first of all, you'd say, oh, it's, it would be sort of surprising if it if it really kept on spreading in the absence of growth. But what you're pointing out is that. If you just at one moment turn off division, then there will still be diffusion and it'll still keep on going, right? But this is the velocity of a wave when it's a wave, when it's described by a function like this, right? So it's true that you could turn off division and it'll still diffuse, but then it, the shape is changing as well. Yeah. Okay. 
All right. I'm going to draw a few lines describing possible populations. Now, let's assume that they have the same diffu motion, diffusion. All right. And I want to know which one has the largest velocity. Is it A, B, C, D? So same diffusion. per capita growth rate as a function of the density for three different organisms. All right, ready? Three. Two, one. All right. So I'd say we have a fair number of Bs, Ds. It seems like a B, it's B versus D. All right. Now, this is tricky because D we have not explicitly considered here. Um, but it turns out that the answer is B. OK. Certainly, between these three, these are all really logistic growth functions. And so from the standpoint of here, it's just this r. And r is the division rate at zero cell density. Right? The, growth rate at zero cell, the per capita growth rate at zero cell density is what determines the velocity in a Fisher wave. Right? And indeed, that's true even if there's no decrease in the, um, the growth up right until you get to some carrying capacity. Right? And indeed, all of these cases, the division rate, the growth rate that's relevant for the velocity is when it hits this axis. Okay. Um, indeed, all of these waves are described as Fisher or pulled waves because there's a sense that the entire wave is determined by the front of the wave. Right, so we drew this profile. OK, I didn't do that very well. Here, this is an exponential. And the exponential actually is what's pulling this wave. Uh, there actually there ends up being a characteristic length scale here that is uh, the square root of d over r, right? So this is the length scale of the exponential, right? And the velocity and the length scale are only functions of the division rate at zero, um, in the limit of low cell density or low density of organism. Okay. Um, the shape of what goes on here changes indeed out this, the bulk properties of the wave, but doesn't change, uh, doesn't change the velocity. Okay. And I just want to make one comparison of all this to, because uh, there's a, another qualitatively different kind of wave, which is a so-called uh, pushed wave. And that's what happens if you have this, uh, uh, an alley effect, in particular like a strong alley effect. If, you're, if this thing looks like this is certainly possible, right? This is an alley effect. Now, if you just said, oh, the only thing that matters is the growth rate at low cell density, you would say, oh, this, this thing cannot possibly expand. Although it turns out that it, it still is possible. And this, in this situation, it would be called a push wave where your profile somehow maybe looks kind of similar. But instead of it being the front of the wave that's pulling the wave, instead it's diffusion around the bulk. Because the bulk is the part that is actually happily growing. Because right? the front here, in this case, is dying. Right? Yet it still is possible to have a positive velocity. Okay? And th so this, this is a, uh, then a qualita qualitatively different kind of uh, population expansion. Right? So cooperatively growing populations expand uh, very differently from logistically growing populations. 
And one of the things that in, in the re reading of physics today talked about is these different rates of, uh, of loss of heterozygosity and so forth in different populations. And as you might expect, the pulled waves have uh, a smaller effective population size than the pushed waves, right? Because here, the relevant population is at the front that's at low density, whereas here, the relevant population is the bulk that's at high density. All right, with that, I think that we should quit. But I will see you on Tuesday, and we'll talk about this neutral theory in ecology. All right, thanks.